Can you talk about crural slash costal diaphragm, diaphragm fibers and their role as a compensatory influence on narrow and wide infrasternal angles? Yes, Javi, I can. It was inspired by a recent video by Daddy O Pops himself, Bill Hartman, which I'll link in the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash breathing dash tips. Check it out. There's going to be a blog, show notes, everything you need there to make it happen. And he talked about the difference between the costal and curl fibers of the diaphragm and narrow and infrasternal angle stuff. And I watched it, thought about it, and I've come to a conclusion. I was wrong. I was wrong. Gosh, what a lamer, right? I probably didn't have the mechanics as well thought out as I did, as I thought I did at least. It makes sense once I thought through what he was saying um, that this is probably a better and more accurate explanation of what's going on with each of the infrasternal angle archetypes. And uh, I think once I explain it good to you, it will make a lot more sense as to why he is ex explaining uh, the, uh, the diaphragm differences in this manner. The big issue with the way I was thinking about diaphragm movement and dynamics before was I was operating under the guise that muscles contract as one piece. And that's not necessarily true. There's this cool study that will be in the show notes that was called this that I think you'll find interesting. I would definitely give it a shot if you haven't. In vivo sarcomere lengths and sarcomere elongations are not uniform across an intact muscle. Basically what they did was they looked at different muscles in, I believe this was an animal study, from what I recall, ah, the mouse tibialis anterior. And they looked at different components of the muscle. And they found that they could create selective contractions, shortening and lengthening within the muscle. Meaning that you can have certain portions of muscles contracted versus another. This leads one to potentially believe that, oh, well, if that's the case, I could potentially have more tension on a, one aspect of the muscle and less tension on another aspect of the muscle. And I think practically, we might see this in some of our supreme clientele. A good example of this is after an ACL surgery, if you have someone who has limited knee extension, but they have a crazy, crazy, folks, straight leg raise. A lot of times what will happen in this case, as my son will demonstrate, or at least his leg, is you could potentially have a situation where the distal component of the hamstrings is concentrically oriented, which will limit knee extension. But the proximal component of the hamstrings could be eccentric, which will allow for your straight leg raise to move unabated. So that's a really good example of having a scenario where you could have a muscle that is concentric in one portion and eccentric in another. I think that this probably also happens at the diaphragm as well. You could theoretically break up the diaphragm into two segments. Although really, if you look at the fiber orientation, you could break it up into significantly more sections, but that's a talk for another day. Let's, for the sake of argument, break up the diaphragm into two segments. You could conceivably bisect the diaphragm in half anteriorly and posteriorly, having the uh, attachments of the rib cage to the central tendon being one portion of it, and the other portion being the low back to central tendon attachment points. And if we were to selectively contract these areas, we would see some interesting things occur. We could see the anterior portion of the diaphragm be more concentric in certain cases, and the posterior be eccentric, and vice versa. Now you might be wondering, Zach, what are those cases? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's where I think we could look at our infrasternal angle presentations to determine who is what. In the wide infrasternal angle archetype, what we see 
is we see an increased, generally, not always, but an increased lumbar lordosis, which is an exhaled orientation of the lumbar spine, and we see a inhaled bucket handle position, or the infrasternal angle is wide, which is associated with inhalation. So there, we have an exhaled orientation of the spine and an inhaled orientation of the lower rib cage. So then you might wonder, how does that manifest at the diaphragm? Well, folks, if the lumbar spine is in an exhaled orientation, and we know that the crural fibers of the diaphragm attach at the lumbar spine between L1 and L4, and it is asymmetrical, we could reason to believe that the posterior portion or the crural portion of the diaphragm likely has more eccentric orientation. And if we look at the front side of the anterior aspect of the diaphragm, since the bucket handle is up, the ISA is wide, you're breathing in, and when you inhale, the diaphragm contracts, we likely have a more concentric orientation of the diaphragm anteriorly, or the crural portion. And this intuitively makes sense based on the attachments and also based on we have to have the, some capability of having concentric and eccentric orientation of the diaphragm so we can move air. If we don't have that, we can't move air. So with the wide infrasternal angle, you will have a concentric anterior diaphragm and an eccentric posterior diaphragm. Now here's the cool thing, folks. That matches what's going on with your pelvic diaphragm, AKA the pelvic floor. Let's now pull my grandson to help us out. With a wide infrasternal angle archetype, we also have a wide infrapubic angle, which is associated with a nutated sacrum. If I have a nutated sacrum and a wide infrapubic angle, if you look at the anterior and posterior pelvic floor, since the pelvic floor is going to be more in a nutated and, and open outlet position, what you will see in that case is the posterior pelvic floor. And I know I'm making that a little bit simplistic because there's many muscles in the pelvic floor. And you probably have some differentiations once we have some asymmetrical movement. But for this archetype, the posterior dot pelvic floor is going to be more eccentric because the sacrum is nutated, meaning the bottom of the sacrum is going to be moving away and stretching out from midline. So it's eccentric. The anterior portion is going to be more concentric. It mirrors what's going on in the thoracic diaphragm. So the backside diaphragms are going to be more eccentric and the front side diaphragms are going to be more concentric in the wide infrasternal angle person. Now, what's crack a with our narrows? Like your boy, boom. If you simply answer reverse, reverse, you would be correct. Because that's precisely what's happening with the narrow infrasternal angle presentation. With the narrow, the, the bucket handle is down, the infrasternal angle is narrowed, and the spine is in more of an inhaled orientation. So at the lumbar spine, it's less of a lumbar lordosis. So if I'm breathing in, it would make sense that the posterior diaphragm is likely going to be more concentric because of the alteration in the crural attachments of the diaphragm. Crural being that attaches to the lumbar spine. Since the anterior aspect of the diaphragm and the rib cage is in an exhaled orientation, the infrasternal angle is narrow, the bucket handle is decreased, that is in more of a eccentric orientation at the diaphragm. So with the narrow infrasternal angle, I am more concentric in the back. I'm more eccentric in the front when it comes to the diaphragm attachments, which guess what folks? It mirrors what happens 
with the pelvic floor in our narrow um, archetype. So in the, the pelvic floor for a narrow, since the sacrum is counter-nutated, the infrapubic angle is narrowed, you're going to have a concentric orientation posteriorly because the bottom portion of the sacrum is tipping forward. And then the anterior aspect is going to be eccentric. It's dropping down, Charlie Brown. So the diaphragms mirror each other in each of these archetypes. And that's a likely more plausible situation that's going on with each infrasternal angle. Now I've mentioned a bunch in the past that if the diaphragm really descends and flattens, the mechanics at the rib cage would invert and problems would ensue. So could you have a situation where that is still true? And I think so. I think you could have that selectively at one aspect of the diaphragm. And this would be where we would see secondary compensation. So for example, if we know for the wide or the narrow that in the wide infrasternal angle, the anterior diaphragm is going to be more concentric. And in the narrow infrasternal angle, the posterior diaphragm is going to be more concentric. If those muscles descend further towards flat, you will see alterations in each of those respective areas. Meaning, for the wide infrasternal angle, this could be a person where if that diaphragm descends to flat, you might actually see the rib cage narrow inward, more so. It might not be completely 90 degrees or less like the narrow, but it could be that individual who has a difficult time bucket, bucket handling either direction, meaning they can't move it further out with an inhaled orientation or they can't close it down with an exhaled orientation. This would be a secondary compensation but I still have to be able to move air. So you might not see as much change in the posterior diaphragm in the case of a wide. For a narrow infrasternal angle, we're talking things are happening at the lumbar spine. So folks, if I am breathing in and I'm getting an inhaled orientation at the lumbar spine, if the diaphragm drops down and it flattens and it creates further downward pressure, into the, the, on the viscera, then if I reverse the line of pull, that would bring the spine in more of an exhaled or forward orientation, which we do see sometimes with our narrow infrasternal angle people. So you can still have a diaphragm that is descending and moving towards flat, but it likely is occurring more in selective areas as opposed to happening in total. And that would be my current thought process regarding the mechanics of the diaphragm. And I have to give kudos to Daddy O Pops himself. Definitely check out the video because he does a really good job of explaining it, probably better than your boy does. So to summarize this question by my man, Javi, narrow and wide infrasternal angle likely have differentiation in terms of what portion of the diaphragm is concentric and it mirrors what's going on in the pelvic floor. So for a wide ISA, they will be concentric anteriorly, eccentric posteriorly when it comes to the diaphragm. For a narrow, reverse, reverse, they're going to be concentric posteriorly and they're going to be eccentric anteriorly. And that can likely change based on secondary compensations and with rotational actions. But to talk about it from a baseline level of our infrasternal angle peeps, that's likely what's crackalacking.